All right, thanks for uh, coming to my talk. Um, I think I ambiguously titled this uh, Optimizing Operating Systems. That might have been the name on the website. And you might be wondering, all right, are, are we making operating systems more optimal, or are we running an operating system that's trying to optimize an application? It's the latter of the two. So uh, welcome to my title entitled End Optimizing Operating System. So uh, setting a little challenge for myself, I thought I'd try to show you the most boring graph that you'll ever see. And uh, what we're going to be doing here is running a program. Its name is Factor. And uh, we're just timing it. How long is it uh, going to execute for? On the x-axis, re-invocations of the program. Y-axis, runtime. So there's a run, 53 seconds. So now what if we throw that in a loop and run it over and over again? Right? The operating system has seen this exact program run before, uh, instruction by instruction. Right? We're not changing any inputs. Uh, this is uh, just a complete repetition. Right? So what's going to happen on that second execution? Exactly the same. Right, but maybe on the third try. Nope. Uh, all right, well, I think we're starting to see a pattern here. But uh, my question for you is, are you surprised? And I think there's kind of two ways that, that you can think about that, right? On the one hand, well, if it's a deterministic program on no input, uh, presumably on a system with little background noise, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. Right? But on the other hand, each execution, that doesn't look good. <coughs> uh, so, uh, sorry, on, on the other hand, uh, we're, we're actually, we're good here. Um, each run took about a minute, about 100 billion cycles of, of completely identical execution, right? And we're running this on a planet with finite resources, right? On a machine that could be curing disease or finding you Bitcoin. So maybe it's a little surprising that, that we don't take advantage of this by default. So this is from Mickey, a pioneer in machine learning. He said, uh, a thousand runs on the machine don't re-educate my handiwork, right? Every, every redundancy is meticulously reproduced. So in this talk, we're going to wonder, uh, what if, right? What if an OS could learn about the programs that it's running and optimize them automatically? Uh, and maybe this isn't total science fiction, right? We already expect a lot of this behavior from our compilers. And us as programmers, we're happy to make these resource trade-offs, right? Longer compile times, maybe more memory usage for faster running binaries. But the compiler is really constrained uh, in that it has to produce a single artifact, the binary. Uh, and this is a compromise across all possible inputs to your program with uh, little or no knowledge of runtime behavior and what else is going on in the system at runtime. And yet we still expect to be able to grab that knob and as we turn it, expect our programs to automatically run faster. So the question here is why not an optimizing operating system? Right? And I argue it's not for lack of power right? to, to the operating system. Or, uh, from the perspective of a process, right? The operating system is like a god, right? In that it's it's omniscient, right? It's omnipotent, and it's omnipresent. And uh, and so the question I'm posing here is, where's our optimizing call to exec, right? The syscall that starts programs running. Uh, why can't I say, try really hard, right? Spend a lot of resources, a lot of parallel cores. Um, making your single-threaded code run faster. Uh, we already expect some of this type of operations from our JIT compilers, like the Java Virtual Machine. And the idea here is uh, uh, doing caching, flattening, uh, branching code into straight line execution. And the OS has an even larger purview than, than a JIT compiler. So, uh, so our vision here is, is we've seen a lot of systems kind of guided by the mantra of uh, don't create overhead, right? Get out of the way. Uh, but what if we actively invested in accelerating these applications, right? With the intention of buying back that investment and more. So I'll, I'll provide a few uh, principles here for the optimizing operating system. So the first one is make some effort to, uh, to actually run that code faster. Uh, secondly, revert back to normal classical computation if you fail at one. 
And finally, I just want to emphasize that we're, even though we might be using some statistical techniques for uh, for doing these, uh, for enabling these optimizations, all of the execution is going to remain exactly correct, uh, bit for bit, with classical execution. Um, so this talk is going to focus on uh, the design of performance systems that they're intentionally designed to remain amenable to optimization. Uh, and that might mean, for example, keeping uh, the, the state of computation uh, accessible as data, right? Maybe in a compact representation, consolidated and ready for uh, prediction algorithms to work on. Um, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm glad to be in front of a machine learning audience. This talk skews a little more systems, but uh, I'd be happy if if, uh, if you come up to me and even if you think it's the simplest idea for for how you might think about some of these problems, we're really right at the beginning of this work. So, uh, uh, And also, I, I'd like to show you a couple of the opportunities where, where you might be able to get involved or, or uh, what you can do in building these systems. All right, so maybe it's time for a little bit more exciting result. So when I joined this research group, uh, my advisor and his collaborators, they're working on this Linux prototype, a system that, uh, that attempts to learn something about execution and to automatically paralyze and accelerate it. Uh, and now running this program factor under the system ask, uh, in this run, we're just looking for uh, what overhead is induced by the system when it's not doing work. And there's our baseline. Uh, comparable to, uh, to running natively on Linux. This time through, we're going to ask it to do a little bit of work, right? Stop that computation, query its state, uh, update uh, some online learning models. And uh, when we run it uh, again, hey, maybe it did even a little bit worse, right? So this is what I'm talking about, investing resources to, uh, uh, to, to actually learn about these processes. And uh, sometimes we might get uh, first run improvement, and uh, uh, but that's just the game that we're playing. So dropping this in the loop, we'll run it 10 more times and we'll see, hey, maybe we even broke through that plateau, right? Running it again, uh, more improvement, right? We're learning more about execution and trying to take advantage of that. Uh, in this next step, we're, we're taking some training offline. We're going to do some batch training and really try to extract everything we can out of those data sets that we've developed to this point. And we see that uh, there's even uh, more room to, to make improvements on these runtimes. Uh, so the techniques that, that we're making use of in this talk, I'm going to talk about three systems. Uh, they all come down to making use of speculative execution. Uh, so speculative execution is uh, it's desirable to us because it allows you to do work that might be conditionally committed to, right? So if you can prove that that speculative work was correct, uh, then uh, then we can commit to it. Otherwise, you've just wasted maybe uh, power or, or uh, parallel resources. Uh, and the way that our first prototype works is as that program starts executing factor, uh, we spend some time querying the state and learning something about it. And if we've developed some kind of confidence about how we've seen it changing in time, we'll make some predictions about where it might be in the future. So without knowing whether those are correct, we queue them on some parallel cores, and we run all five of these cores in parallel. Uh, this is our opportunity to extract parallelism from the signal. So I think this is better seen in an animation. So in our work, we, uh, we developed a mathematical formalism, uh, excuse me, a formalism that maps the instantaneous state of a program. So any possible state that, uh, that a process can be in to a unique point in a high dimensional space. Uh, what you're seeing here is that space being flattened down to 2D. Uh, and just take a look. So what you're seeing initially is computation, that program factor starts running in the bottom left-hand corner here. And uh, after some amount of time, a series of speculations are created, and they're all run forward in parallel. Uh, and it's only when that initial thread, which we're running classically, uh, reaches the speculative point exactly, uh, a bit for bit match of that speculation, that we've proven that that was actually on the computational trajectory, and we can commit to whatever 
uh, work has been done in the intervening time. And uh, so I was first seeing this system, I was coming from more of a physics background, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I had no idea you could even think about computation in these terms. And uh, so I was, uh, I was impressed to see the system generalizing to, uh, to a class of problems. Uh, and interestingly, uh, also on unseen inputs, right? So what I was showing you was running an identical program over and over again, but we can even run programs that branch conditionally on their inputs, and we can see first run speed up for new inputs, right? Trajectories that uh, we've never actually executed before, but because we're leveraging learning that was done on uh, similar trajectories, same program, different inputs, uh, we can even see speed up on the first time that you're running the program with a new input given prior learning. So I think this is a pretty interestingly constrained problem, right? You have a runtime upper bound, how long it takes to run this thing classically, but how much better can you do? And looking closely at these ephemeral execution sites, right? Any overhead that that you spend deploying computation into them uh, reduces the breadth, the number of speculative sites that you can run, or the depth, how far you can push into them. Uh, and and speaking to the the constraints of this type of uh, online learning problem, right? Every freeze the world moment that you spend introspecting on that initial tra uh, trajectory is time that could have been spent proving out more of it, right? Learning more about that computation. So it's really a, maybe a, a tricky optimization problem that uh, I need help with. <laughs> so, uh, so we started wondering, what if we took this Linux prototype app and we developed a custom operating system that just implemented a few of these operations uh, very efficiently, right? Can we reduce the overhead on these predictions, maybe allowing us to do uh, more or, or deeper predictions? Um, and as I started looking at that, it really came down to a few manipulations of process address spaces uh, that, that had to be uh, very quick, right? Operations like, are these two address spaces equal? Which is easy enough, right? I'll just check all the bytes of memory. But of course, uh, if you want to keep this lightweight, minimize computation on the critical paths, you can't do this, right? So maybe you have to come up with something more clever, maybe uh, some kind of incremental summary data structures that are maintaining uh, uh, knowledge about the difference in, in how, these, uh, how these address spaces are evolving. Other uh, simple operations like cloning and, uh, and taking two address spaces and applying one over the other as a diff. Right? These two operations taken together are how we make those predictions. Right? Take your current point, clone it, and then query your predictors, update the state, and you can run from those points. Uh, so while I'm off working on that, learning about um, some systems uh, techniques, so about page tables and dirty bits and copy on write, my lab mate and uh, future collaborator, Jim Cadden, has just come back from an internship at IBM. Will you give them a wave, Jim? Um, <laughs> So as of last week, that's Dr. James Cadden, fresh on the job market. Uh, anyways, Jim was in the headspace of uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, Jim was in the headspace of cloud computing, right, where users want their high-level code running fast, and cloud providers want to squeeze everything they can out of their, their hardware. Um, Jim was exploring potentially more performant and better isolated OS primitives for cloud computation, in particular, considering ditching OS and uh, hardware-level virtualization for faster to create unikernels. Unikernels are, are a neat, if esoteric, OS gadget uh, that have proven useful in our work, and so I thought I'd give you a quick crash course. So, uh, so taking a quick tangent from uh, cloud computing, uh, for the purpose of a contrast, consider your standard application monolithic OS uh, breakdown. Uh, and I contrast it with a unikernel, right? Here in the unikernel, we're embedding the application inside of a single address space with some system components, whereas normally they live in two separated domains. 
Uh, this gives us some cool properties. One of them is customizability, right? If you have uh, two applications that both run, say, network workloads, one is sensitive to throughput, the other to latency, right? You can put in a custom network stack that's tuned to your application. Another feature is uh, kind of the independence of failure domains. And uh, what you could think about there is uh, in these two worlds, one world running uh, this monolithic stack, on the other world uh, on top of this lightweight unikernel monitor, you have a gold <laughs> process generating this red data, a pink process generating that green data. Well, where is it going to be stored when you drop it into the file system? Right? In, in one world, they're shared in the same kernel structures. In the other, uh, there's replication. So you can imagine if, uh, if the gold application finds some way to subvert the kernel and uh, learn something about the file system, it could potentially learn about the pink application's data, whereas, whereas that might be much harder in the unikernel space, where if you subvert your own file system, you only learn about your files. All right, so uh, the last thing to, to think about here is uh, some differences that really pop out when you're multiplexing these things, right? And particularly, excuse me, in particular, you notice the memory duplication, uh, and that's something that we're going to come back to. But uh, what I want to draw your attention to is how well these unikernels kind of package their uh, data into a uh, single flat address space, and that's part of our system design of keeping these things uh, amenable to uh, uh, to keeping these things amenable to uh, learning algorithms, right? So the idea there is that uh, when I want to grab the full state of this uh, running unikernel, that's a really easy oper uh, operation. Whereas if I'm up there trying to grab the full state of that gold application, I'm going to have to go down into the kernel and pull data, kind of gleaning it from different data structures. Um, anyways, that's the end of our uh, unikernel crash course, so let's come back to cloud computing. So uh, the functions as a service model uh, is perhaps the most fine-grained cloud service on offer, right? It, it promises clients instantaneous access to arbitrary computational parallelism, right? You can go in there and say, hey, here's a function, run it 100,000 times on these inputs, and you expect that to be distributed well across the back end of the service. But this really shifts the burden from the application developer to the cloud service provider to be able to quickly create these safe execution sites uh, and to maintain their isolation on these backend invokers. Uh, as a super quick function as a service crash course, right off the critical path, users upload their functions uh, in whatever high-level languages, Python, JavaScript, Go. And uh, on demand, they'll send uh, run requests, right? Execute my function f on this input x. And the platform's uh, duty is, is to execute them, to multiplex them on these back-end nodes, uh, maintaining isolation and keeping this performant. And between Jim's unikernels and some of my prior work, it started looking uh, promising, right? These transient functions need access to these uh, executional sites, right? Functions can be deployed in parallel, and, uh, uh, and also there's significant overlap between functions, right? If you write two Python functions, foo and bar, they, they differ in their function state, but they're all running on the same Python interpreter, so there's a lot of uh, opportunity there to express one of those functions as uh, in terms of a single diff applied to another. Uh, so here's, here's our setup for the experiments that we run. Uh, uh, so Jim and I sat down for a year and worked on retrofitting a container-based function-as-a-service platform, Apache OpenWhisk, uh, really just working on the invoker, the last box all the way to the right. Uh, and we retrofitted a custom unikernel-based operating system called SUS. Uh, and just to just to drive at the difference, the uh, our baseline system is running uh, Linux containers. Our drop-in replacement is running uh, unikernels. And uh, we learned a few things from uh, from the work that we did here. 
about how to build a fast function as a service system, right? And what it really came down to was two points. The first one was maximizing the amount of functions that you can cache on the system, right? So uh, if your user says, hey, I want you to run F, if you have it sitting ready to go, uh, you can run it way faster than if you have to, say, bring up an interpreter, uh, drop in that uh, the source code, maybe pre-compile it before running it. So the first thing is caching these functions, and the other thing is when you miss in the cache, being able to constitute one of these cold start environments quickly. Um, so to that point, right, we talked about the memory duplication going on in these unikernels, and that really seems like a killer for being able to cache a large number of these objects, right, all this memory duplication. And that's exactly what we saw at first. Um, on, uh, on the same node, we were able to fit 3,000 Linux containers. And because of all the duplication in our system, SUSE was only able to hold 800 of them. But uh, through a technique called uh, snapshotting that I'll get into, we were actually able to do aggressive memory sharing between these environments and, and cache uh, 52,000 uh, functions on, a, on the same node that containers are stuck caching 3,000. Um, and so our secret is no secret at all. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a technique where you provide uh, the ability to instrument high-level source code with a function call, right? That makes an exact copy of the function state uh, that can later be deployed from. And uh, just to emphasize here, the idea is not that users are instrumenting their own code with these calls necessarily. That might be a toggle that you choose to provide. Uh, we uh, made two lines of source change to how uh, to how we deploy our um, our invoker, right? So we introduced two of these calls to take a snapshot, which enabled all the memory sharing and the uh, latency speedups that I'll show you in the following slides. Right, so, so to understand how we're making use of snapshotting, uh, it's helpful to understand the lifetime of these functions. And there's a lot of parts to that, but it really breaks down into two pieces. The first part is your language-specific snapshot, right? That's bringing up your interpreter. So bringing up your JavaScript interpreter, your Python interpreter. And then on top of that, specializing the environment to your function, right? That's your function foo. That's your function bar. Uh, and there's really these two key opportunities uh, for employing our snapshotting technique. Returning to that phase space diagram, you can think of this as uh, booting one of our unikernels and, uh, and faulting in a ton of memory, 100 megabytes, well, relatively, uh, to get that interpreter up. But at that point, taking a snapshot, right? This thing's immutable. It's going to be held in memory. It'll never be modified. Uh, and later, we can, deploy, we can deploy functions from that interpreter, right? So now we're no longer paying the cost of the memory cost of bringing up that interpreter. Uh, we can deploy from these snapshots in sub-millisecond times. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which we're able to take advantage of these diffs applied to starting states, right? So this uh, booted JavaScript interpreter here is the blue state, and then each of these specialized functions is a small diff on top of it. Now, the real power of this technique is the ability to take snapshots that are relative to predecessor snapshots, right? Uh, and the idea here is that snapshots will trace a lineage back through prior snapshots, somewhat like a fork tree. And this is really what allows our massive memory sharing. Uh, we have a much higher degree of sharing than processes. Uh, everything, by default, is shared, including heap state, for example. So from these specializations, right, this is just the, the refining snapshot for bar. You can deploy it and uh, accept any arguments as input and run from those states. 
Uh, so we talked about caching. The other side is when you miss in the cache, you're on a cold start path. So what happens there? Well, in our comparison point, uh, you're on a container creation path. And one thing that we found in, in our work is that container creation takes a long time. These are great tools for what they're built for, but trying to shoehorn them into this function as a service application without, uh, without doing special work to optimize them really uh, gets you in a lot of trouble. So this, this first line right here, that's 500 milliseconds. That's five seconds to create a container. Um, so what you're seeing here is a few different degrees of concurrency. So whether you're using one core, two, four, eight, 16 to create these containers, we see two non-scalabilities. The first one is that the more containers in your system, the longer it takes to create the marginal container. The other one is that it doesn't parallelize well across uh, across um, multiple cores, right? So uh, so perhaps there's uh, there's some kind of locking going on uh, that's preventing these from uh, from from scaling in parallel. Uh, so with respect to our cold start times, once these container creations get on the critical path, uh, we see containers are taking around half a second to bring up. And naively, SUS uh, shaves a couple uh, 100 milliseconds off that time. Right? But with snapshotting, we're able to take that down almost an order of magnitude. And then using uh, uh, a form of speculative execution, we're able to cut that down uh, by another significant factor. Factor. And so we've taken these cold start times from human time scale, right, F four, 400 milliseconds, uh, down really close to cr process creation times. And that's a good sign if you're trying to run a real uh, uh, function execution model, which might be doing fan out and consuming a lot of these environments uh, rapidly. So the argument uh, for how snapshots reduce latency is the same as how they uh, help with memory, right? Bring up that JavaScript interpreter, spend a third of a second, you take a snapshot. Just to, uh, just to drive this point, we do this once on the node per interpreter. So there, this, this happens one time at system initialization and never again. Then you can uh, start running your uh, uh, your various functions on top of that uh, snapshot. You can take that recursive snapshot to amortize those library imports, those pre-compilations, to get yourself uh, into a state where you're ready to deploy execution. Um, Okay, so uh, another penalty that these unikernels suffer is if you're using off-the-shelf components here, then your system components probably aren't designed to be low latency on, on their first use, right? There's no reason for a monolithic kernel to, uh, to have uh, uh, an optimized network stack that's ready uh, to have optimal performance on the first packet because you're almost never in that case, right? But unfortunately for us, once you deploy that that JavaScript environment, it's sitting there waiting for source code to come in from one of these functions, right? So that means that every deployment that we send out is going to face those first-time initialization penalties, and they can be significant from what we've measured here. Uh, so now turning to this technique of uh, speculation. So we're doing this by hand, but I, I, what I want to drive at is uh, that there's value in pursuing the, in automating this. But the idea is in Instead of taking that snapshot right after you bring up the JavaScript interpreter, go and send in a dummy packet, right? Just to exercise all of those paths and snapshot after that, right? This allows, this gives you a little tool to, to factor computation out of all of these uh, function paths and, and drop it into uh, these early snapshots that you only execute a single time. So I'm showing you factoring execution time out of these paths, but it's the same for memory usage. Uh, what, what I think would be interesting here is how do you figure out, well, what, what do my users actually use, right? Like, uh, what libraries could I factor out? What, uh, could, I, could I run benchmarks that stress a whole linear algebra uh, uh, benchmark to get all, as much memory as you can pulled out so that you can hold more of these uh, on our node? 
So some quick graphs. Uh, so here's the container-based system. You're seeing 